And Father God, um, again this morning, we, just, we, we ask that you would speak to us, Lord, that, that it would be your word that speaks. That just um, truly, Lord, that I get out of the way and that you would just be speaking to each heart here, including mine, through your Holy Spirit. Just the things that you want us to know, the things that you want to point out, the things that, the plans that you have for us, Lord. Um, you know how you want to use each soul here, and, and you have called each soul here this morning, um, specifically and, and purposefully and individually, Lord. There, there's no mistakes in this room this morning. You've brought every single person here to hear your word this morning, the word that you've prepared. So we just, we're eager to hear what it is, Lord. Um, we're eager to see how you're going to work in each one of our lives, and we just give this time to you, and we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are, um, as we've said a couple of weeks in a row now, we're working through what truly is the heart of this letter. You know, and as we've said, even in just the structure of this letter, the way that this text has been put together, we are receiving a lesson even in that. You know, our theme throughout this book has come out of Romans chapter 8, verse 6, which is for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And as we've, we've noted now, the first 11 chapters of this book really were geared toward addressing where the people had fallen into that carnality that our theme verse has spoken of, just fallen into that service of self, self-centeredness and selfishness and uh, just self-concern, <laughs> and all of those areas that, that do lead to death in our lives, whether it be spiritually or relationally. I mean, selfishness will kill your relationships, you know, or, or physically, physical death in all of these. And through chapters 12 through 14, where we're working through now, we're being led repeatedly and throughout into the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, that, that is the whole and the bulk of the text through these, these heart chapters here, the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit, which always at its base will point us toward and move us toward our Savior, toward Jesus Christ. That, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And then when we get to chapter 15, it's going to be, it is an exquisite chapter. We're going to spend at least a month and a half in chapter 15. It's going to be for us a 58-verse treatise on, on the resurrection, what the resurrection is and why it was necessary and what it means to us. There, there's a heading over that chapter in my Bible at home, chapter 15, that just says simply, the risen Christ, faith's reality. And that's what that chapter is going to boil down to, really. So in all of that, I mean, see it, the, the front end of this book deals with the fruit of carnality, which is death. And we have seen that repeatedly as we've moved through. And then chapters 12 through 14 point us toward the remedy literally being spiritually minded, literally being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then when we get to chapter 15, what it's going to be is we're going to go into great detail about the joy and the hope and the assurance of the life and peace that is provided to us through the resurrection of our Lord. So it's moving along that same basic progression from the carnal to the spiritual, from death to eternal life. But for several weeks now, we've been, we've been turning on this hinge through chapters 12 through 14 here, this hinge between life and death, and between the carnal mind and the spiritual mind. And as we're seeing, the oil that greases that hinge is literally the Holy Spirit. It's the whole ball game right there, without whom, you know, we, we have no ability to live a life for Jesus Christ. Without the Spirit, as we've seen in this text, we have no ability even to proclaim Jesus as Lord without that power that the Holy Spirit gives. But through these, through these chapters, you know, it, it reads, as we've said, it reads like an anatomy lesson that the Apostle Paul is laying out for us, an anatomy lesson specifically of the body of Christ. And a couple of weeks ago, we were introduced to the major systems of that body of Christ, the pieces without which the body cannot even exist. We saw the mind of the body of Christ, God the Father. And we, we saw the heart of the body of Christ, Jesus Christ, who is also the head, in the power of Jesus Christ, God the Spirit. And then last week, you know, we, we, we kind of zoomed in, we got that, that close-up view of the functions and the processes of this body of Jesus Christ, just looking at the various gifts that the Holy Spirit gives, the various ways that the Holy Spirit, the power of that Spirit is exhibited in an individual life. 
the ways that that power is exhibited even in a ministry or in a family or in a community. And now this week, what we're going to get into this week, we're going to see the structure and the makeup of the body. All of it just being plugged into those structures and functions and processes that we've been through already. And we talked about how the verse to close out this section, chapter 14, verse 40, the words there, it says, let all things be done decently and in order. And those words, truly, they frame the entirety of this section that we're moving through right now. Let all things be done decently and in order. And we closed last week in verse 11 of chapter 12, which says, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, and distributing to each one individually as he wills. And in that, you know, the, 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 just the truth of that verse right there, in that there will be a diversity in how the Spirit works in a body of believers. There will be a diversity in how the Spirit works in a fellowship. And, and what we're going to see this morning is going to be an expansion of that thought, very basically. As we closed with last week, we talked about nobody wants to hear an orchestra composed entirely of kazoo players, and nobody wants to sit through that. And God is able to bring many people with many different backgrounds, many different areas of expertise, many different instruments, so to speak, and he is able to gift them as he so desires, and he gifts them individually, and he is able to work them all together in in harmony, leading us just in this symphony of God's grace, and we have an amazing part to play, each one of us, and and our parts are not going to look alike in the way that those work out, and God has a specific part for you, and that's what we're going to be going into this morning, but just jumping in in verse 12, it says, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. So now we get to this idea of the body of Christ, you know, being compared here directly to a human body. (laughs) And it's it's not just a happy coincidence in that. You know, it's not not like Paul was sitting there, hey, hey, the human body kind of works for this if we want to do it that way. That's not what's happening here. God is revealing here that the human body, which he created himself, which he wove together himself, he is revealing now that he created the human body in part to portray how he envisioned his church would work. This isn't just a coincidence. There is purpose even in the way that you are designed to portray the truth of what his church was intended to be. One body, many different parts, many of them, most of them unseen to the human eye, (laughs) all of them working together of one accord enjoined by the same head, enjoined by the same heart. There are two very basic traps that believers tend to fall into whenever we consider what our role is in the body of Jesus Christ. The first trap simply is growing proud of the gifts and the abilities that God has given to them. That's the first trap. I'm just getting proud, thinking in whatever way God has gifted you that somehow it has something to do with your own merit. With, you, with your own strength, and it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. You cannot fall into the trap of growing proud of the gifts that you've been given by God. The second trap, it's on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. The second trap is beginning to think that, that, that you have nothing to offer the body of Christ. Absolutely a trap. Both things, both things, whether it be being proud of the gifts that you've been given or being convinced that you've been given no gifts, that you have no role to play in the body of Christ. Both things, both, both lines of thinking are the result of comparison. I mean, think about that. One looks down on others and just by nature of what it is, and the other looks up to others, where you begin to think, well, I'm not gifted like they are, so I must not be gifted at all. <laughs> you, you're probably very familiar with the old Theodore Roosevelt quote, you know, comparison is the thief of joy, Right? Comparison is the thief of joy. Very apt, very true. But I challenge you, take it a step further when you think of comparison. Comparison is a breeding ground for idolatry. You either, when you compare yourself to others, you either, either, even with the best of intentions, you begin to put other people up on a pedestal where they do not belong, or you elevate yourself onto a pedestal where you do not belong. In either way, Either way is sin. 
(laughs) Either way, your attention is drawn everywhere except where it needs to be, which is simply on Jesus Christ, who belongs on the altar of your heart, in the altar of your mind. When your eyes are on Jesus, he shows you what to do. That's just plain old true. (laughs) He will give you a heart for those who he wants to reach. He will give you a passion for what he wants you to do. That comes from him. And we'll see this morning, none of it, none of whatever he ever gives you to do, none of it is inconsequential. Our Lord is amazing in the way that he moves. He moves so massively, but in the same breath, so intricately in the way that he chooses to work, in the same exact breath. The things that we think are small, the things that we think aren't even things because they, they, they take no effort to do, they come so naturally to us, the things that we think are nothing type of things, our God uses mightily because that's what he does. He does mighty things. What he does through a life, whatever it is, it radiates out like a, like a ripple. In those ripples, they travel far beyond where we can even begin to imagine. They spread across the world by the power of the Holy Spirit just by simply being available and willing to how God wants to work in your life. So we read here, just as the body is many parts working as one, so it is with the church. So it is with the body of Jesus Christ. But verse 13 here, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact... The body is not one member, but many. You get the feeling Paul's trying to hammer home a point here. (laughs) The body is not one member, but many. But we see here, Jews or Greeks or slaves or free, there's an important distinction here. You you know, and we have to see it as we enter into this section. What what we're seeing is, is not that the body of Christ eliminates every difference between us. We aren't made into identical marbles, you know, when, when when we accept Jesus with our lives. We make a mistake when we begin to seek uniformity and call it unity. That's not what our God asks of us. (laughs) Becoming a Christian is not being molded to look like everyone else and, and to be like everyone else. That is not our Lord's intent. Becoming a Christian, giving your life to Jesus Christ, it is being patterned into the image of Jesus Christ himself. And he is faithful to do that. But the way that that happens and the way that that looks, it looks very different life to life. But it's his image that we are being conformed to. We are not being conformed to each other's image. That's not our God's will. And what we read here, we aren't made to drink into one race. We aren't made to drink into one nationality. We're not of one social class, not not even one political party. We are united by something much higher something much more important, something that reaches much, much further. We are made to drink into one spirit. We are all baptized into one body. And Paul would put it this way in Romans, when he writes Romans later on, Romans chapter 8, verse 14, he would say, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So if you, that's the qualifier That's the whole thing right there. If you are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. We are one family, one family of many children of God, one body with many parts and and many members, and we will have different interests. We will have different focuses. There's going to be plenty of different personalities and things, plenty of different gifts, but we will have one purpose, and we will have one Lord. And we are united alone in him. But verse 15 here, it says, if the, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, it is, therefore, is it therefore not of the body? Which is ridiculous because feet can't speak, you know? <laughs> so, if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, you know my feeling on that, that'd just be creepy. <laughs> If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now, God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleases. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? So as much as we shirk uniformity, you know, as as much as we embrace 
diversities of gifts and differences of ministries and diversities of activities or actions, everything must still be bound by the confines of our God. We, we cannot forsake Him when we consider how this body is joined together. Remember what we saw earlier in this chapter, the same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God. Everything is bound by Him. We cannot, in seeking unity, we can't break free from that triune truth that we're being presented with right here in this section. Same Spirit, same Lord, same God. It cannot be joined together outside of those three. So, you know, as much as we can't say, like what we're reading here, as much as we can't say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, just as equally we cannot say, because I'm of the body, I can be a hairbrush. You know, there's no provision for that in Scripture. There's no provision for that in the body that you have physically. <laughs> you can't just say, I, because, I, because I'm of the body, I can be a mountain bike tire. It doesn't work that way. To be of the same body, we must be made of the same God. We must be. <laughs> you see, a great many right now, this is so important in the way that you see Christianity treated right now. There are so many right now who try to take Scripture and mold it into whatever they want it to be, to, to fit whatever life they want to live. And that's not how it works. You know, any more than a kitchen spatula can say, I want to be a foot in the body. It doesn't work that way. There must be a change. There has to be a change to the inherent DNA, to, to the makeup, spiritually speaking. God must be your God. He must be your God. Jesus must be your king. He must be. The Holy Spirit must change your heart. The Spirit must fill your heart. And that makes you into a part of the body of Christ. And nothing else. And you will be used in that. When those things are true of your life, you will be used, and you'll be used in great diversity and great variety, just like the parts and the, the structures and the functions of the human body. Lots of differences, but they still all belong to the same body. And they are all directed by the same head and fed by the same heart and moved by the same nerves. And so much of what you see right now are everybody trying to be a head when they join the body of Christ. And you leave that behind. When you give your life to Jesus, he is the head. You don't call the shots anymore. As we've read in this book, you are not your own. <laughs> you were bought at a price. Don't try to be anything other than what God has called you to be. And once he's called you to be something, be that. <laughs> he has specific and beautiful purpose for each person, for, for each piece of his body. And in the same breath, don't begin to think for a moment that your gift can be self-sufficient. That your gift can somehow be self-contained or even self-determining. That you can decide what your gift and your calling are. Each piece, every part is answerable to God first. And moldable by God and sustained by God. But in verse 20 here it says, But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. I think Paul's trying to tell us something here. <laughs> and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the feet, or the head to the feet, I have no need of you. I mean, every piece, this is, this is just basic truth when it comes to, to, to physical truth, but it, it applies at such a deeper spiritual level. Each piece needs the rest of the body to survive. Each piece needs the rest of the body to thrive. You know, it, it's a funny thing when, when every, we shut down for COVID. We didn't, I mean, we never once shut the door. We met outside for a long time. That, that happened, I think, maybe eight weeks after I'd come on staff as pastor here. There's not a manual for something like that. You just, you just have to go with God, what God's Word gives you. And his, God, his, his Word was faithful, but we were quick when, when everything began to shut down a couple of years ago, I guess three years ago now. We were quick to reference Hebrews 10, 25, where it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And, and rightfully so. That was the right verse for that time. That was what we held to during that time. It was a great verse to lean on in the face of what we were seeing. But in all that, I mean, that, that was the what to do. It, it was a what type of scripture, right? What we're seeing here today, this section here, it's more the why it says that. 
It's the explanation of why a verse like what we see in Hebrews 10 is there. It's why it's important not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It's not just that we quote the verse and rest on that. There's an explanation here in what we're seeing in this chapter here. God does a work when we gather together. And it's, and it's undeniable. He does a work through each one of us. It's not a big mystery. It's not, it's not mystical in the way that he works. He takes all the different ways that we each have been gifted, and he employs those to be of aid to everyone else who comes. That's why he brings you here. You are not brought here just to hear a message and go home. You are brought here to minister to the others that he's brought here today with the ways that he has gifted your life. It's an amazing thing, an amazing thing. So much of ministry happens face-to-face in the one-on-one type of conversations. And again, so rarely, so rarely it happens with any, with any pomp or, or circumstance. Just, it's just a matter of coming alongside someone else and showing them the love of Jesus Christ, however he has gifted you. Showing them his love in a real way, whether it be just a word of encouragement or an apt verse from God's word, or just coming alongside them to pray, we gather because he does a work when we gather together. And God does a real work. <laughs> and he is present when his body gathers together. We know the verses in Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20, where Jesus says, again, I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. And that is not at all to suggest that if you find yourself alone, you know, if you find yourself isolated, that Jesus isn't there. Not at all. (laughs) We have distinct and rich promises from our Lord. He is always with us. Always. To the end of the age. But it is to say, you know, there is a difference when his believers are together. There, there's a reality, a realness maybe that, that you can't find on your own. And as we've said before, I mean, if you bolt for the doors as soon as the service is over, you're the one missing out. And other people are missing out on the way that God has gifted your life. Stick around. <laughs> Get to know the people that he has placed here and, and know in that that he will be ministering through that. Because there is something real that happens amongst us when we gather together. It's something that cannot be replicated by anything else. It's the literal fitting together of the body of Jesus Christ. It is being used together corporately in his hands as only he can. And that's what we're seeing here in this text. You know, the body of Christ can do incredible things when it's put together in proper order. I mean, just consider your hand. You know, a hand is an incredible piece of machinery. It's an impossible piece of machinery. It is something that could not have happened on its own at all. (laughs) When you consider all the bones and and the ligaments and the muscles, even just to move your hand to wave at somebody, you know, the skin even, you consider that our God designed the slack in our knuckles to to be able to accommodate bending our fingers at all. He he foresaw that we would need the skin to stretch in in that place. Your wrist has eight bones. Your wrist alone has eight bones just in the wrist, and each one serves a specific function to give you the mobility and the rotation that you need to do everything you do with your hand. You have three main nerves that run just to your hand that control all the movements in it. Just just your hand. It's an incredible piece of God's creation, and he's given you two of them. (laughs) But they are worthless on their own. They they are non-functional on their own, without arms to move them in space, without the heart to supply blood flow to the tissues, without lungs to oxygenate the blood or or the brain to send the signals and and contract the muscle memory. They're absolutely useless on their own. Understand the reality of that in what we're talking about this morning. We are useless outside of Jesus Christ's body. No part of the body can say to another, I have no need of you. As we've already kind of touched on, I think most people here realize the value of everybody else around them. I don't think that's a problem at all. I think we realize the value of everyone else around them. You realize the necessity of everyone else far more often. (laughs) Far more often I hear where people try to, to disqualify themselves. Where they start to say, you know, the body of Christ has no need of me. I don't do anything. And it's simply false. 
It's simply false. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 tells us, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship, and we were created for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, works that he knew we would do, <laughs> that we should walk in them. That is true for every single believer in Jesus Christ. You were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Psalm 138, verse 8. I, I was woefully insufficient on, on filling out your bulletins this week. I think I put two in your bulletin, uh, and God added like 15 more after that, so I apologize. But Psalm 138, verse 8 says, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. The, the New American Standard translate, translates that verse as, the Lord will accomplish what concerns me. And the Christian Standard Bible might be my favorite of the set on that particular verse. It translates it as, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. And that's true. That's true. God has specific things that he wants to do through your life. And, and those things, they will be of great help. Great help to those around you. And you're, and you're sitting there thinking, but what? You know, I hear you say these things, but what? I do so little. I, I, I don't do anything. And, and what's true in that is that everyone who earnestly serves God with their lives, they think the exact same thing. I don't do anything. <laughs> I don't do anything because what's true is that God does everything. When you walk through life filled with the Holy Spirit, God will do all kinds of things that you don't even think twice about, and he'll use them greatly. Far after, you've, far after you're done thinking about them, he will continue to use those things, and they will affect people immensely beyond what you'd ever think possible because God does something miraculous when you just declare yourself available to him. It's like we said last week, be filled with his word, and his word and, and his wisdom just tends to come out of your mouth. But you got to be filled with his word. <laughs> be continually in prayer, and your eyes just start being open to more ways that you can be praying for people. Rob said a couple of Sunday evenings ago, and he was attributing it to somebody else, and now I'm attributing it to him, so it's none of our quote, but it's a great quote. He, he said, God is not looking for ability. He's looking for availability. Keep that in mind. <laughs> in verse 22 here, it says, No, much rather... Those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think, less, we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. So, in all of this, you know, our judgment of a gift, you know, our perception of a gift, it's a very little consequence in the greater scheme of things. You know, the things that we through our fleshly eyes, might see as weaker. We, we see here that they are actually necessary. They're needful. The things that we may esteem to be as less honorable, we read here, on these we bestow greater honor. Our unpresentable parts, this is a fascinating word, the, the word more literally is shapeless, our, our shapeless parts, the things that are harder to define, you know, the things that don't happen on a stage, frankly. The things that people may not even realize are going on. These things have a greater, it says, modesty here. And that's a bit of a funny translation for that word. The, the word in the Greek is officially impossible to pronounce. So it's, it's, it's five syllables and 12 letters, and most of them are vowels. So you can look it up on your own and do your best with it. But the word in the Greek for modesty, it means decorousness or, or comeliness or noble, of great honor well-formed, in contrast to the shapeless word that we just saw, our seemingly shapeless roles, these are the most well-formed, the most beautiful in the eyes of our God, and his eyes are the only ones that matter. Flatly, the things that happen outside of the public eye, the, the things that are essentially shapeless to those who just aren't looking for it, the things that people wouldn't necessarily notice, when they walk in the front door, you know, in prayer, always, prayer falls into that category, always. Just a kind gesture, as we've already said. 
an, an extra effort on behalf of somebody else who may even never, know, never even know that you did anything for them, just something that you saw they needed that you provided for by God's leading. And all they know is that their day was made easier by whatever it is that was done, that their day was made brighter by what you did. It is these hearts, the, the hearts that are ready to, to stoop low and, and wash the feet of another. These hearts are called noble here and of greater honor, decorous. <laughs> In verse 24, though, it says, but our presentable parts have no need. You know, so the parts that people do say, there's no need for extra care with them. There's no need for extra attention, no need for extra honor. This is the concept that Jesus went into. If you want to flip with me um, to Matthew chapter 6. It's a couple of books, handful of books to the left. Just starting out at the, the top of the chapter, verse 1, Jesus said, all these words are in red. <laughs> he said, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have their glory or have the glory of men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be seen, may be, may be in secret, and our Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. It's a fascinating text. God will reward openly every kind word. He will reward openly every good deed done in secret, every deed none unseen by other eyes. The greater honor in what we're going through this morning, the greater honor is to those who have faithfully answered God's call in the quiet things, specifically, in the things of the heart, the things that only God can see. The greater honor is there. But if you want to flip back to 1 Corinthians, continuing through verse 24 here, it says, but God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. God composed the body. I mean, highlight that verse. <laughs> and return to it next time you're upset with somebody here. <laughs> God composed the body. He's the one who brought us together. He composed the body, having given greater honor to the part which lacks it. So you, you think about it. Yeah, just practically speaking, in this comparison to the human body that we're going through, nearly every exterior organ we have is non-vital. Did you ever think about that before? You, know, you can live without an eye. You, you can live without an ear or, or a hand or a foot. I mean, yeah, absolutely function is hindered without any of those. But the, but the loss of that particular organ is survivable, except for the loss of the head, which is immediately lethal. And that's apt in the comparison that we are seeing today. I mean, the head of the body is Jesus Christ. You lose that, you're done. You lose that, you're done. Colossians 1.18 tells us he is the head of the body, the church. But outside of that head, every other front-facing gift, every external organ, so to speak, every single one of them is imminently replaceable. All God needs in that, all God needs is a willing heart, a humble heart, and he takes care of the rest. But then you start thinking about the interior organs, the things that nobody else can see. You know, you need a stomach. You need a liver. You need a kidney, right? You need lungs. You need blood. You need a spleen, even. I mean, the, the most necessary parts are largely unseen. They are literally of greater honor. They are of greater importance. God put the human body together that way so he could teach us this lesson this way. And he put the body of Christ together the same way. God composed the body. And he tends to put the fools out front. <laughs> That's just what he does. And you're sitting there looking at me saying, we already know that. <laughs> if you're not thinking it, my family is. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 says, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world 
to put to shame the things which are mighty. It's a testament to his strength. It's a testament to his patience. You know, I can even use a guy like this. That's how powerful I am. He has composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, that we would be united by the same spirit, that we would be bound to the same Lord, but he has given greater honor to the part which lacks it, that the members should have the same care for one another. So in that, honestly, when was the last time you tracked somebody down from the cleaning ministry or the lawn mowing ministry and said, you know, hey, this place always looks so great. This place is so well taken care of. Thank you for sacrificing your time for allowing yourself to be used by the Lord. Have you ever said those words? I get, a lot, I get a lot of encouraging words, and I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. But just think about how many people pour their hearts into whatever God has called them to do to make this happen this morning. And think about the guys greeting you when you come in the door. That's a ministry, you know, making sure that you know that you're welcome here, that you belong here when you walk in. And the people that are always helping out with setup and with cleanup, you know, or the Sunday school teachers teaching Your kids, you know, to date, today, you know, I remember more things I was taught in Sunday school than any other thing I learned in a service here. Those are the moldable years. Those are the years when those seeds are planted and they begin to grow. I remember the faces that impacted me there in Sunday school more than anything else. Those are the lasting, lifelong lessons that God imparts through willing hearts in the Sunday school. You think about the people up in the sound booth, you know, running the radio, and the live stream, and making sure that you can hear the word sitting there this morning or, or wherever you're listening to it out, out in the world today. These are shapeless things. These are things that you don't think about, things that you don't see. And if they weren't pointed out, you'd hardly give them a second thought. But they give the body the ability to hear and to see and to understand just through how the Holy Spirit uses them. We have an awesome prayer chain here. An awesome prayer chain here. People who are faithful to pray faithfully over the many things that come up. And not just, you know, oh, I'll pray for you about that. These are people who spend real fervent time in prayer over everything that comes up. All the time. And all of it. All of it. Every single piece of it contributes to every message you will ever hear here. Every word, every word spoken from this pulpit is prayed over and labored over by a great many. And I'm just the fool you get to look at. <laughs> if you want your prayer, this is, this is something that my, my, the church that my wife grew up in, the pastor would say often there. He would say, if you want your pastor to preach you full, pray him full during the week. And that happens here. That happens here. Because that filling, it can only come from God, the filling that you seek. So pray during the week. Every song we sing is impacted by every single one who has surrendered their lives and made themselves available to however God would call them. (laughs) Your entire experience here is impacted by everyone who has humbly surrendered to God's different callings on their lives, especially, especially in the shapeless things. God uses all of it. He uses every single piece of it, and to oversize, overemphasize any gift, to overemphasize any role over another, it would naturally lead to division and schism between us. But in verse 26 here, it says, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. For if one member is honored, or, sorry, not for, or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. This is true across the board. This is true across the board. When you function as one body and one member suffers, the whole body feels it. The whole body feels the loss and the pain together. And it is part of the beauty of what Jesus has woven together. We're able to be there for each other as we go through those sufferings. And conversely, when one member is healed, when one member is honored, when one member is lifted up, all the members rejoice with it. It's like, it's like your body it's a, it's a, it is that close to you, and we rejoice with each other in each other's victories. And it is a beautiful thing that our God has put together. But in verse 27 here, it says, Now, you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps 
administrations and varieties of tongues. So as we read these, there, there's a common mistake in how these two verses are read. As we read these, understand this is not establishing a, a hierarchy of rank. You know, the apostles first, then the prophets, then the teachers. That's not what is happening here. This is a very practical order of need that's, that's being outlaid here, a, a progression in how the Word of God works anywhere. Just This is undeniable. First, one must be sent with the Word of God. That's what an apostle is, one who was sent with a particular message, one who's been commissioned with a message. That has to happen first for the Word of God to work anywhere. Somebody has to accept the call to be sent to that place. More commonly today, we see that in the form of a missionary, but, but one who will carry God's Word wherever God has placed them, wherever He sent them. And, and that can be anyone, anywhere. You can be used as an apostle wherever you are, work, grocery store, in your neighborhood, you know. First come the apostles, then second, the prophets, one who will speak God's word. And these can happen hand in hand. One who will be sent with God's word, one who will be faithful to speak God's word. Third, teachers. And once you've spoken God's word, somebody needs to teach it. Somebody needs to supply an understanding of it. This is just an order of progression here. Let the people study the word and examine it and know it. Let them hide that word in their hearts. And after that, After that's been established, then come the miracles. And like we said last week, miracles take on a lot of different forms. The the word here, more literally, it means mighty work. Or it can be used for for abundance. (laughs) And we see that when the word of God is brought anywhere. You see it in a changed heart. That's a miracle. A heart given over to Jesus Christ. That is a mighty work. Once the word has been carried in, and spoken and taught, miracles inevitably follow. Lives are restored. You know, addictions, the addictions get replaced with a relationship with Jesus Christ, which is the only thing that can wipe away the strength of an addiction in a life. Stress is relieved. That's a miracle. Old, deep, incurable wounds are healed, most often emotionally spiritually, but also physically. Miracles happen. Marriages are restored when the Word of God is brought in. Sin, more important than anything, sin is forgiven and laid aside, and that is a miracle. Death is overcome. These are all miracles. Miracles follow wherever God's Word is present, wherever it's proclaimed, wherever it's taught. Inevitably, mighty works, miracles, start happening. And then we read here, and then the gifts of healings, helps, administrations, variety, varieties of tongues, basically the rest. (laughs) Remember, the Corinthians and all this, there's significance in the way these are ordered here. The Corinthians were attempting to hold the gift of tongues above all the other gifts. That's, That's who they were basing their identity on. And essentially, they were trying to treat it as though the gift of tongues were the first gift or the most important gift Or they were trying to establish it as the only gift. (laughs) And Paul very purposefully here is putting the gift of tongues at the end of the train here. He did it in the listing of gifts we saw last week. He does it again this week. (laughs) And the point here is that God does weave together a body of believers. And he begins instilling all of these gifts. Everything we've seen over these last few weeks. He instills all of these gifts to make that family function well together. Healings and helps and administrations and and varieties of tongues. But he says in verse 29 here, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? And the implied answer here, very basically, um, to each one of these questions is no. Not all have these things. Not everyone is called to these things. Anyone, anyone who insists that you must have the gift of tongues to be saved, bring them right here and walk them through it. You know? Not all have all of these gifts. But as we've said, all are gifted by God in one way or another. And in that, the question becomes, just as we said last week, the question becomes, God, what do you want me to do? And whatever his answer is, it will be laden with the gifts that he intends to work through you. Which leads right into this next thought, verse 31, but earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet, I will show you a more 
excellent way. Earnestly desire the best gifts. And the word best here is the word kreton in the Greek. It is literally the nobler gifts. And we just spend a whole lot of time on what God considers to be more noble. We just spend a whole lot of time on what God considers to be of more beauty. It is the unseen things. The shapeless things. Understand that as we read through this section. The things which the world tends to spend the least amount of attention on. These are the most noble. These are the best. William MacDonald puts it slightly differently. He says that the best gifts are those that are most useful rather than those that are spectacular. The best gifts are those that are most useful rather than those that are spectacular. All gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. You cannot deny that. And none of them are diminished, but, but a healthy body of believers runs on the presence of the Holy Spirit, specifically manifested in speaking the Word of God, preaching the Word of God, teaching the Word of God, and on prayer, and on the exercise of those unseen, shapeless things. That makes for a full fellowship, a full body. Truly, the best gifts are the ones that God intends to use through you. So find out what they are. Find out what it is that he wants to do in your life, the ones that he intends to use through you to draw people to himself. And that takes on a lot of different forms, but as we've said, all of it must be exercised humbly and willingly to exalt our God above all things. And the close here almost belongs in the next chapter. We're not even really going to touch on it today, but the close, and yet I will show you a more excellent way, and then Paul's going to dive into that next week. So, So read chapter 13, with that phrase heavily on your mind, I will show you the more excellent way. Read chapter 13 this week, and we'll see what God has for us next Sunday morning. Father God, just as we come before you this morning, we, um, (laughs) again, Lord, we we realize how unworthy we are (laughs) to be used by your hands to, uh, Lord, to have a God like you, but you have provided a way for us to have fellowship with you, You've provided a way, Lord, for us to be considered as your children, as your beloved. We we don't understand why you are as patient as you are with us. We don't understand your long-suffering, Lord, but daily you are giving us a greater understanding of your love. And in that, we just, we want to rightfully and honorably serve you with the life that we have remaining, Lord, with the breath that you have given us um, and that you will give us through the end of our lives, that you would just be using us in whatever way you would see fit, and that we would be ready and willing and and available, Lord, wherever you would lead us. So uh, just in this coming week for each one here, Lord, I ask that you would just be present in each one of their lives, that you would just be uh, protecting them, (laughs) sheltering them, Lord, that you'd be ministering to each one through your Holy Spirit, just what it is that you want to do, that you'd be directing each one in the steps that you would have them go and leading them down that path, Lord, and truly that you'd be filling each one and gifting each one for the work that you you want to see happen lord the work that needs to be done that we would just um that we would depend on you for 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 every breath lord for every thought for every word and and for when we start to stray away from you that we would just be quick to return quick to surrender to you lord um we just we thank you so much for who you are and just ask that your word would be uh readily available as we go through this coming week um (laughs) <laughs> that it would be right on the tip of our tongues, whatever word you want to speak, and that we'd recognize, Lord, it's your word. It is your word alone that does that work, that we would just be quick to abandon our own thoughts and our own wisdom and our own words, Lord, and we'd rely instead on yours. And we know, Lord, you'll be faithful to provide him. So, Lord God, we, again, we just, we, we give you our hearts and just ask that you, you'd use us in this coming week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And you are all dismissed. We have no closing song this week.